So people in the business of paying for software development always have two questions on their mind. Can you guess what they are? How long is it going to take? How much is it going to cost? So much energy has been spent answering these questions or at least attempting to. But people take the premise for granted. And I'm going to argue that these are actually the wrong questions and that there's a better question that we could be asking and answering instead that does the same work that we want these questions to do. But first, I need to lay the foundation for this argument. First of all, I'm just going to simplify here and assert that in software development, how long is it going to take and how much is it going to cost are roughly the same question insofar as the answer to either is going to be proportional to the number of developer hours. When somebody asks you how long will it take and how much will it cost, what information do you need to answer the question? You need to know precisely what you're being asked to estimate. And then you try to remember something or ideally many things you did before that was similar to all or part of the job. Even better, you have data from years of timesheets meticulously tagged with said similar things. Although, you know, I mean, you've got to be really scrupulous to have that kicking around. But, you know, good on you if you do. And you try to get some decent coverage with prior art and extrapolate the rest. And that's your basis for your time estimate. How you manipulate that number uh, afterward, of course, is up to you. But, you know, this sort of formula or heuristic, if you want to call it that, is, is the basis. And later on, I'm going to get to why this is such a slippery topic, especially for software development. Everybody knows that to solve a complex problem, you split it into sub-problems and then you keep on splitting the sub-problems until you have a bunch of sub-problems that are small enough to be tractable. And then you solve each of the sub-problems and assemble your results and, and upward until you get the complete solution. This is the thesis of the architect Christopher Alexander's uh, 1964 PhD dissertation called Notes on the Synthesis of Form. Or rather... His thesis is that there exists an objective, mathematically optimal way to decompose a given problem based on its inherent structure. Uh, furthermore, he asserts that if the problem is not decomposed in the optimal way, the non-optimal decomposition pattern will introduce flaws and failures in the design and that will translate directly to cost overruns and benefit shortfalls. So Alexander's idea was that you go and you find all the basic concerns of the problem you're trying to solve, which he calls fitness variables. And these fitness variables can be understood as nodes in a graph. And each node is in a state of being satisfied or unsatisfied. And then the connections between the nodes represent mutual influence, such that flipping one fitness variable will either flip, um, affect all of the other ones by satisfying them also, or otherwise uh, flipping them from a satisfied to unsatisfied state. So it either does this or it does this. So when you're trying to solve for one of these concerns, you need to take all of its neighbors into account and then all of their neighbors and basically like, you know, one thick doing one thing will affect, you know, some, something else. Um, so Alexander's solution was to find the partitioning line that cuts the smallest number of these connections. And then of course you repeat the process recursively with the two pieces all the way down to four or six, you know, eight, 
1632, etc., all the way down to have a hierarchical structure which is tractable. So perhaps the most salient aspect of this book for me was the sheer magnitude of wrong answers in relation to the right one. One right one. That is, if you have a connected graph of size n nodes, then you have two to the power of n possible ways to cut it up. And yeah, so that means that there's two to the n minus one ways to get this pattern wrong and only one way to get it right. Alexander related one insight here that instantly stuck out as being important. If you overprescribe the categories that the parts and pieces of the problem are meant to reside in, you're practically guaranteed to get it wrong. And this is just a feature of the fact that the possible substructures of like a given problem space vastly outnumber the words in the English language or whatever language you're using, but English is a particularly big one. So picking a category heading like database, for instance, is going to contort and pollute the solution because it's gonna draw an arbitrary boundary around uh, some subset of the system and is almost certainly not going to be consistent with the actual structure of the problem. The good news is that Alexander is describing a well-known problem in computer science called min-cut, uh, which is well-known because it has a lot of applications. Uh, the bad news is that the problem of finding an optimal graph partition is NP-hard. And if you're not familiar, that just means the exact solution is impossibly expensive. You're never like you could all the computing power in the world wouldn't be able to do it. The good news, again, is that since Alexander published his dissertation in 1964, there have been considerable advances in algorithms that yield approximate solutions. And finally, the bad news uh, is that even though the topological decomposition business is a fascinating and useful theory to have in your head, uh, it may not be as widely applicable as it looks. And here is what I mean by that. When I found this book in 2008, I was like, yes, this will be great for effort estimation. All I have to do is get the requirements, hook them together into the structure, and then I can feed the structure into an off-the-shelf mid-cut algorithm. It'll punt out the hierarchical decomposition. And then I can take the results, estimate the elementary parts, and then add up the individual estimates. That'll provide a basis for an estimate for the whole thing. What are the problems with this? Um, number one, getting the requirements is a shitload of work. Like they can't be nebulous statements like must be easy to use. Like they have to be specific and they have to be quite granular. So you like the actual amount of time that you spend just producing these, these fitness variables is quite high. Um, you know, way, way more than your typical requirements analysis phase in your like conventional software development process. Like way, 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 way more. Um, yeah, so in order for this process to work, you need hundreds. Like you need, they need to be like, they're fine grain, they gotta, and, and you end up, yeah, you'll end up with hundreds, you could end up with thousands. Like it's not difficult for this to happen. Um, so two, changing the underlying structure radically alters the decomposition pattern. So let's say you've got your fitness graph or whatever, and it's all connected and, and, and like you say, oh, well actually like this thing connects to this thing. And, and like if you did that and then you reran the decomposition, you would get a completely different project plan potentially. Um, and so any new information that you get during the process is going to, um, you know, like you can't, you can't promise anybody anything in any, at, at, at any point given this kind of uh, constraint or this kind of uh, behavior. Um, so number three uh, is that estimating a project by uh, adding up its individual estimates of its parts is worthy of its own, and that's a, something that's a completely separate topic as an entire premise needs to be considered in its own right. And so it's worth asking briefly why this uh, approach works for construction projects in 1964. 
Why it works for construction projects is if you look at the per cost profile of a construction project, something like 80% of the money goes to materials and labor of building the actual building. Uh, and the remaining 20% is split between the architect and the, construction, the structural engineer. And I'm not counting the cost of land. That would cut you know, all of this in, in half at least. Um, so with respect to the empirical task of obtaining these fitness variables, hooking them together, like that's what the architect is there on the project to do. And why this approach works in 1964 is because your options for computing are punch cards on rented hardware. So you're not going to go back and run this a second time, or, uh, you know, if or when you get new information. And like, even if you could, there's so much inertia in a conventional construction project, it wouldn't matter if you did. Like, you know, you go and you find out that there's some new thing and you're like, oh, like you rerun it and you say, oh, well, actually the project should be this complete different way. Um, like it would say, oh, too bad. Like, you know, these people have already, the bids are all in for all this. This is done. This is a done deal. We're making it like this. It's not gonna, we're not doing anything different from, from what we've already baked in. Um, so the take home here is that the structure of the project affects the estimate and new information will affect the structure. So getting this information is empirical work. It's irreducible. And if you use arbitrary categories rather than like the actual discrete math that describes the structure, you're overwhelmingly likely to get the structure wrong. And let's just say there's a reason why Alexander abandoned this method, which I will also get to eventually. So let's suppose you do manage to get an optimal decomposition, hierarchical decomposition pattern for your project. Herbert Simon in 1969, it's very interesting that this is all sort of clustered around the mid 20th century, uh, called these systems nearly decomposable to the extent that like most of the parts of the system don't interact with each other um, and most of the other parts, but like they only interact with a few of them. Um, and in the everyday world, you can understand the problem this way. It doesn't matter what order you put your shirt or your pants on, but it absolutely does matter that your pants go on before your shoes go on. And what happens if you get this wrong um, you have to take your shoes off, put your pants on, then put your shoes back on. So like you've you know, multiplied the amount of time that you've spent working basically, but just getting the, getting the order wrong. In other words, it costs you. Um, and so on a project, you could have a hundred elements that don't interact with each other, but they cluster into say five groups that absolutely does need to be carried out in a strict sequence. And how do you know that you've got that sequence right? Like, and what is the penalty for being wrong? So let's imagine a toy model where uh, each of our five path dependent steps takes one day to complete. So our estimate is five days. So we say, well, we'll do this in this arbitrarily prescribed order. We're gonna do it one, two, three, four, five. And what we don't know is that the actual order of dependency is five, four, three, two, one. So we try number one and we find out we can't complete it. Then we try two, then three, then four. And then finally we get success with five. With five complete, we say, okay, well that one step was completely out of order. or That was clearly out of order. Let's get back to the plan. So you try two again, can't do it. Then three, then finally four and so on. You know, uh, so for five path dependent steps for which we don't know the order of the dependency, your worst case with do overs is 15 days, not five. So you say, well, I'll, I'll be clever and I'll triple my estimate. The problem here is that the numbers are, are triangular. So if there were uh, six steps, the worst case would be 21. And three times six is 18, not 21. So you're still gonna be over budget, uh, even if you triple it. Uh, yeah, so the size of the worst case penalty is n squared plus n over two. Uh, that's a triangular number. And so that's not as bad though as the odds of getting the sequence wrong because that's the permutation. The permutation of the elements of a set, uh, that is to say all possible ways you can put them in order, uh, is the factorial of the number of elements 
So five factorial is 120, meaning that you've got the five element sequence is 119 wrong configurations to one right one. And six factorial is gonna be 719 to one. So you have impossible odds of getting the right structure multiplied by impossible odds of getting the right order. Uh, and granted, the wrongness is going to vary, you know, immensely in degree. So you will be wrong about your estimates, potentially by a lot. And the point of these last several minutes is to illustrate precisely to what degree the deck is completely stacked against you. So how do we reconcile these odds with the people who succeed? Because people do succeed. Well, overruns are caused by surprise in the sense that something doesn't go to plan. Namely, the aggregate total of things not going to plan exceeds your budget for things not going to plan. And I just de detailed two mechanisms, two ways that things cannot go to plan, and that's like not even counting anything like in the outside environment. That's just like within your own project. Not cutting the project up into the right pieces, not doing the path dependent pieces in the right order. And these reduce to not getting or otherwise, you know, appropriately processing the information needed to do this important work. So how do you eliminate or otherwise absorb surprise? Only committing to the most conservative, well-trodden work. It's I'm going to expand on in a second, but like a really good way to eliminate surprises is to just stick to the things where all the surprises have been wrung out, preferably by somebody else, many, many years or decades or millennia ago. Two, padding the absolute hell out of your estimates, like to the point of being actually embarrassed, like to the point that the client would fire you if they knew any better, like that's how much you're padding, like just insane amount of padding. You know, you do like, oh, you have the thing you can do in one day. Well, you take a month to do it, that kind of thing, like ridiculous. You know, and of course you're charging for that. Uh, yeah, which brings me to the next point, which is charging an absolute buttload of money. If you charge a lot of money, like a really, really obscene amount of money, then there are a lot of situations you can just buy your way out of, like not original development, mind you, but like you might be able to buy yourself out of some other hang up that uh, to free up the resources to slide in under the wire. And then, of course, number four is bullshitting your way out of it. You know, just be like, solar flares or some shit, I don't know. So I suspect the people who are consistently successful, you know, uh, facially successful at, at effort estimation, at least to onlookers, are doing at least one of those things. So my pet theory about what's going on with effort estimates is we're taught to empirically determine a plausible average number and then pad for safety. So we're doing the bell curve thing and then we're like moving, you know, a certain number, you know, of, of probability, standard deviations, whatever you want to call it, I mean, however you want to measure it to the right, basically, is, is what we're effectively doing, whether we're doing that consciously or not. And what's actually happening in this scenario is that unless we have hard sample data to draw from, we're just recalling our own experience with similar projects. So what are we most likely to recall? The most common outcome, as in the mode, as in the peak of the like bell curve. Worth noting that in a normal distribution, the mode and the mean and the median are all the same number because it's symmetric. And when you pad your estimates on a normally distributed task, you're implicitly covering the variance, uh, enough of the variance, that you're gonna nearly get all possible outcomes. You know, if the thing is tight, and you, you're always gonna pad, you know, if the thing is fuzzy, you're gonna pad. If it's tight, you're gonna pad. So you're always, always, always going to get, you know, like if you pad within two standard deviations or something like that, you're gonna get pretty much every, every outcome. Uh, and so, yeah, if you're in the habit of doubling your estimates, for example, easy, you know, that's, you're, you're going to get that. You're going to nail it. It's fine. So I'm just going to assert here that there's good reason to assume that tasks 
that don't have a lot of room for surprise are gonna have completion times that are normally distributed. They're gonna be those things that are like the really, really conservative, well-trodden, and you know, somebody's wrung out all the uncertainty about it, you know, over many, many millennia. Um, and this is not, I'm gonna argue that like, that software development in particular, even though it's not unique to software development, uh, has a tendency to be not normally distributed. Like it's not, and it's not unique to software development and it's not even, you know, all aspects of software development don't necessarily exhibit this property. I'm just like arguing that software is like a fertile place for this kind of phenomenon to happen. You know, fat tailed uh, processes. And this has to do with the fact that there are a lot of surprises in software development. And furthermore, those surprises are gen like capable of generating more surprises and then those surprises generate surprises and so on. And that's basically a description of a fat tailed process. And what that means on the ground is that if your process is fat tailed, no amount of padding is safe. You could pad 10x, it doesn't matter because you're gonna get blown out of, wa out of the water by the next like 11x, you know, overrun. And so that's what I think is happening with effort estimation. The padding heuristic works for thin-tailed processes. The people doing fat-tailed processes who don't acknowledge that's what they're doing are like routinely disappointed. And furthermore, there's another constraint that is observable in fields like construction where accurate cost estimates are a business critical practice. Any building project can be estimated to a first approximation if you know one number, the square footage of the building. With that one number, or actually, you know, two, not that you get the square footage of the building and then the square footage of the lot that the building is on, you can determine roughly how many floors, how many elevators, because like, you know, if you, you gotta subtract a piece of floor for the elevator to go in, you add floors, you need more elevators, you get removed floors, you add more elevators kind of thing. Uh, same thing with stairwells, you know, because uh, more area means more, need, more needs more stairwells uh, and then needs more floors, etc. How much concrete, how much glass and other materials, how much piping, ducting, cabling, and if you have historical data, which one would hope if you're a building contractor you do, how long it will take to build. A uh, construction estimator can then work within this one parameter to painstakingly over weeks to months parse reams of already completed specifications from the architect. It comes in on a, you know, back in the days of, uh, of uh, paper, it would come in on a trolley because it, you, know, you wouldn't be able to lift it. That's how much spec there was for these guys to parse through. Uh, you know, and they could just come up with their bid you know, from the architect and the structural engineer. And if you want an example from the tech industry that has a nicely behaved initial constraint like this, I submit user research as a good candidate because the size of the job is proportional to the number of participants. You know, you might have different configurations of that, but like it's always gonna be some function of like, you know, how many people you're interviewing and, and whatnot. So there have been attempts to do this kind of thing for programming and such as function points, story points, that kind of stuff. Uh, they don't represent objective constraints in the environment, and I don't, I don't consider them to be especially rigorous. So now I want to turn to my attention to the premise underpinning the how long will it take and how much will it cost, and why I think we can do better. I, I'm going to assume that the purpose of effort estimation is in general to answer these questions, and the purpose of answering these questions is to set budgets and deadlines. And the purpose of setting budgets and deadlines presumably is to control resources and set expectations. So here's the rub. Effort estimation is actually a structurally, mathematically bad way of achieving this. And I got to credit uh, Carlos Bueno uh, for what I'm about to tell you. This head smackingly obvious revelation that has nevertheless escaped me like almost my entire career. When you estimate by adding and multiplying up from zero, your errors accumulate 
and they do so in the bad direction. That there is instead a, a technique called a Fermi estimate, named after Enrico Fermi, uh, that starts out at a maximum and then subtracts and divides its way downward towards some sort of you know, equilibrium number. Uh, and furthermore, the errors tend to, to cancel each other out. And this is the how many left-handed piano tuners are there in the greater Chicago area, that kind of question. Um, so before I proceed to with how to do a Fermi estimate with software, I want to remark on one other thing with regard to estimation, and actually two. One, is that square footage thing, that's a Fermi estimate. So, you know, the construction workers and you know, all that, uh, the building contractors and stuff are, are, are doing that already as a sort of setting a baseline. Uh, the other is, is, is uh, have you ever noticed that it's easier to estimate some development work that you don't want to do? Like, oh, this is going to take so long. I don't want to do it. So they're going to come up with excuses to not do it. They're going to try to like discourage people from, from wanting to take this on because it's going to take so long or whatever. People chalk this up to some psychological, uh, you know, explanation. Like we're optimistic about the things we want to do, and we're pessimistic about the things we don't want to do. Um, there may be indeed be some truth to that, but I don't think it's the whole story. Um, I think there's a lot more going on there. When we estimate for deadlines, the question we're asking is, how much time is this thing not going to take more than? When we're estimating for rhetorical purposes, the question we're actually asking is how much time is this thing not going to take less than? See the difference? The former is exhaustive. It's expensive. You have to identify and eliminate all of the sources of surprise in order to get, you know, an accurate, something that you can actually work with. The latter, all you have to do is start counting until you hit some convenient threshold and then we say, oh, it's, it's going to take a week, you know, at least. And then, you know, you can quit because, you know, you've, you've made your argument at that point. You just hand wave the rest of it. And so I've come to call the ordinary no more than estimates right side estimates because you're coming at it from the right side of the number line and the rhetorical no less than estimates the left side estimates because of the opposite. So I want you to keep this idea in mind. The way you do a Fermi estimate with software is to recognize that all software can be ascribed a value per run. And the number of runs per unit time can be measured. So it's quite feasible to derive a value per say year, or more appropriately, come up with some plausible life cycle for the software you know, multi, you know, you can say how many years it's going to take to achieve some certain value or what have you. This is going to be the easiest when the particular software intervention is tied directly to revenue. But it's not too hard to come up with proxy metrics for situations like nonprofit or institutional entities. Uh, and even in for-profit scenarios, like very little of the code is going to contribute directly to revenue. So we're going to have to come up with proxy metrics most of the time. But the question we ask is something like, how many runs is this piece of software going to need to get in a given interval to be worth spending X amount of time on followed by, what are the odds of that? And then we can discount this in a number of ways. For starters, the valuation itself should be calculated using the discounted cash flow method. So, you know, you say, well, this, you know, we, if we completed it this date, you know, it's going to depreciate a certain amount, you know, and it's basically like um, discounted cash flow is like a compound interest backwards, more or less. It's like a, uh, yeah, it's compound interest like upside down, more or less. And, you know, and it's what uh, tells you how many dollars you'd have to get in a year to be worth the same to you as say like $100 today. You know, what's your value on that? So the how many runs valuation question can be padded with a profit margin or like an analog of a profit margin. Um, and, you know, you can have an option to set a date after what the intervention is worthless. So you say like, you know, if it's not out by Christmas, it's worthless. You know, you could just say that, discount it to zero. 
Uh, and finally, you know, we can discount the whole thing by the probability of, of, of success. And what this is going to amount to is a big, hairy differential equation, but, you know, we've got computers for that. Uh, actually, this is a good thing because the scheme is, you know, likely to undervalue specific interventions. And a final remark is that any work that is not itself conspicuously valuable is almost always a dependency to more than one element that is conspicuously valuable, so it can be said to partake in a fraction of the aggregate value uh, of all its dependents. So at the end of the day, we control resources not by asking how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost, but by figuring out how much it's worth and then saying, well, if you can't do it in less than this amount of time, don't even try. But more to the point, every discrete intervention evaluated this way is going to begin with a tiny valuation and then because the discounts are going to start off huge. But every intervention will be greenlit to spend some effort gathering more information about it, which will affect both the, uh, the valuations and these left side sort of you know, rhetorical estimates. So to recap the principles, instead of trying to answer how much this particular software intervention is going to cost, we try to figure out how much it's worth. And then we figure out how well it would have to perform in order to earn back different investments of time and ascribe probabilities. And if it's too unlikely that a given in intervention will yield a return, you don't do it. Uh, and note this is like absolutely gambling. We are gambling on every unit of time we spend. Most of the time we will lose, but the gains are asymmetric, so we will win on average. Uh, so armed with this valuation mechanism, it's time to pay, take a, to paint a picture of how to operationalize it. I want to preface that I'm not claiming any of this is especially original. So if it resembles what somebody else is doing, that it's a coincidence. Um, I spent all my time trying to figure this out myself. I didn't check to see if anybody else came up with the same or similar conclusion, but I wouldn't be surprised if somebody did. It's not like, you know that groundbreaking. Um, but I want to make an observation first about in-house teams. Like everybody's on salary, the cost of the team is fixed. You know, so if it's a million dollars a year, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be proportional to that next year and so on. Um, if they're agile, they are regularly delivering software functionality and presumably that software functionality is worth more to their employer than the team costs to maintain. And an in-house team could switch to this methodology I've been describing pretty, pretty easily. There wouldn't be too much to change. The hard nut to crack is how do you do this on a contractual basis? And what precisely do you promise a client that you're going to do for them? How do you make it sound attractive? Going to have to address the marketing aspect some other time, but right now I'm talking about how the contract works and how it interfaces with project management. So what we agree to is a longitudinal relationship with the client at the scale of their financial year. That is, we allocate a fixed number of hours for a fixed number of dollars, which we distribute over the, the length of the engagement. Over this allocation, we have checkpoints at regular intervals. So like every month is ideal. You could conceivably do every two months or even three, but like the, for a premium, but the long, going longer than that kind of obviates the point, which is to lower risk. And at this time, at the interval of the checkpoint, all the work done in the preceding interval is billed. All the rights to the work product are transferred when payment is received. We set high, low and high watermarks uh, for hours per interval, such that the average between the two will run uh, the allocation down to zero exactly by the end of the engagement. So we're billing hours, but we're billing hours on rails. The client can't get billed more than the total amount per engagement, and they can't get billed more than the higher, high watermark per interval. So there's not going to be any sticker shock. And if, however, there's enough capacity, we just keep working all the way up the high watermark, uh, and the engagement will run to completion much sooner. And I should footnote here that this is not a profit maximization strategy. This is a risk minimization strategy. So if you want to try to maximize profit, there's other ways to do that. You know, but in principle, you could, you could probably you know, still use a similar, similar model. You just wouldn't be doing this particular contract. So 
Now to discuss the actual content of the work itself and how it gets done. Um, the basic unit of motivation is something I'm calling the issue. And an issue is nothing more than a statement that there's some state of affairs in the world that there needs something done about. So it's like pretty much like identical to a, to a fitness variable uh, in uh, um, Alexander parlance. It could just be like, you know, analogous to a, a bug, except that the scope of it is quite wide, much more broad. Like you can have like a bug in the universe that you need to, you know, that you need to fix kind of thing. Um, issues don't say about what to do about them. They only attempt to articulate the problem, not any particular solution. That comes later. Um, issues are, are what get ascribed a value and the initial set of issues should be workshopped with the client or written by the client themselves. And we should also leave open a mechanism for the client to add more issues uh, once they get the hang of the format. This work comes together very quickly and will likely result in more issues we can possibly address in the time allocated. This is fine, it's actually kind of the point. Our goal is to create more value than we cost, not necessarily to do any particular task. So in these issues, we're amassing as many opportunities to create value as we can get our hands on. Now, you may want to know about how we prioritize. And here I want to interject uh, an insight from Alexander's dissertation. People will generally agree on whether a given issue is valid. Where they tend to disagree is on how important it is. And with this regime, we capture everything because it's cheaper to capture an issue than to argue about whether or not this or that issue is important enough to be captured. Just capture it, you know? It, we can sort it out later, it's not a big deal. Now, let's imagine a horizon representing a technical detail. Above the horizon is the initial set of issues. I should just say the general level of technical details. So above the horizon is the initial set. The, you know, the client's seen them. They, they've touched them. You know, they've they peed on them, whatever they've needed to do in order to claim them. And then below the horizon is, is where we start to address what's actually going on to take these and address, take, to address these issues. What, what we actually need to do. So we respond to these issues with positions which are proposals for specific responses to the issue. These, while an issue gets ascribed a value, a position gets ascribed a cost. And these are the left side estimates I'm talking about, right? These are the ones that are cheap and easy to do. You can say, well, you know, this thing is not, not gonna take any less than a day to do. Is it worth it? You know, maybe there's another approach that's, that's quicker. Well, you put that in there. That's how that works. Um, and so we continue to do this by further, further uh, by registering arguments uh, about why a particular position should or should not be adopted. So like you have issue A, you have position B, and then you also have position C, and then you have argument D that says, no, well, position C is kind of crap. You know, you know maybe we should do position B. Um, you know, this is why, of course. And this process continues along. We build up more and more of these connections. We're basically building up the fi fitness graph that uh, Alexander uh, proposed in 1964. Uh, so with all these nodes connected with the system, we can do things like compare our left side minimum cost estimates to, on positions to the very evaluations of these issues and furthermore derive a sequence of operations informed by the structure of the system. So you will get the dependency information that you, you know, that you need in order to figure out the order that you need to do stuff in. And as for the decomposition, just leave it as it is, leave it as a hairball, it's not a big deal. You know, you're gonna look at, at any given time, you're gonna, need, you're gonna need to see its neighbors in order to do the planning anyway. You don't actually have to decompose it mathematically at that point. I mean, you might you know, want to, but I wouldn't adhere too, 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 too much to it. So, yeah, where we gain our efficiency is in not going against the inherent structure of the, of the project. The project has a structure of its own. And we're not trying to impose a decomposition pattern and we're not trying to impose a sequence of operations. We're saying, we're gonna look at what we have and we're gonna do what we can do today 
with whatever piece or part of it. And this is going to snowball and it's going to aggregate up to, 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 to you know, value being created. And if some stuff doesn't make it in the, in the allocation of, of dollars and hours, we'll do it another time, you know? Uh, um, and, you know, obviously there is, you know, there's stuff that, 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 uh, that you're going to want to have in that, uh, you know, within the allocation. But those are the things that you will just discount to zero. You say, well, if it doesn't, if it's not done by this date, don't do it. And that, that'll give you a very, you know, clear mandate uh, for whatever it is. I mean, it's really the, the stuff that, that has the surprises attached to it is the stuff that we're worried about. But we might as well throw everything in the pile at this juncture because of why would you have one regime for one kind of class of thing and a different regime for a different one? So where am I here? It's worth remarking that this technique of connecting together a network of issues, positions, and argument was invented by a guy named Horst Rittel, who worked with Alexander at Berkeley in the 70s. So all of this theory is quite mature um, and it even has been given digital treatment, you know, dating back to the 80s. I think the first guy did it in 1988. So my contribution is mainly this valuation mechanism and figuring out what the contract needs to say in order to make this process viable uh, outside of a big company. And I've also written some very crude prototype software to help capture this structure. So to some people in the agile community, uh, this might look like, you know, they might look at this and they'll say, this is just a bug tracker. This is just user stories. To which I say, good, you, you, should, you should have no trouble adopting it then. But cheeky remarks aside, I can, I can highlight two major differences. Number one, the issues in the system have arbitrary scope. And so they're more than just software bugs. It's like I was saying, it's like a bug tracker for, for the universe. Um, you know, there's a, there's a hole in the universe. We need to fix it kind of thing. Um, number two, uh, we separate the declaration of the problem with the proposals uh, uh, for a solution as well uh, as from the discussion of those proposals. And an ordinary bug tracker typically has a comment section, but it doesn't distinguish between these, these types of comment. Uh, and finally, I, I want to address the UX community who, if there's any of you still watching, are probably wondering where stuff like user research, persona scenarios, content IA, and so on fit in. And what I would say is this, one very important role of this structure is to get stakeholders to acknowledge that specific issues are worth something to resolve. And again, this is not all about writing code. Indeed, the structured argumentation is intended to concentrate information and, decision, and aid in decision making. So, for example, a number of these issues are going to raise questions that can only be answered empirically. In other words, user research. Uh, well within this framework, we should be able to price the answers to empirical questions. And in other words, uh, provide the rhetorical basis for, for instance, a user research budget. You know, you can think about applying that to similar things, IA, you know, whatever. So this um, presentation represents years of research and experimentation. It's the first time I've put together the entire thing uh, uh, from theory to concrete implementation. It's my goal that at the very least to provoke some discussion uh, around how software development is procured, contracted, designed, and managed. And so I'm looking to for forward to discussing this approach with all of you.